All right, so I'm Scott Moulton. I've done uh, quite a few talks here. I'm from a company primarily myharddrivedie.com, which is a data recovery company, and I do forensics for a living as well from Forensic Strategy Services. So we cross back and forth and do a number of different things. So, uh, so as you guys can see, this is supposed to be recover my porn from my raid array. So if you guys aren't either interested in raid arrays or porn, then you're in the wrong talk. So maybe you want to leave. So, and uh, I got the idea from this talk from Carlo down here. Stand up, Carlo. Wave. Thank him. <clears throat> He's going to do discreetly recover your porn. So if you don't want it posted on the no, anyway. <laughs> All right, so what does this talk about? Basically, uh, we're going to kind of run through real quick just the uh, ideas of what RAID is. Uh, how many people in here are dealing with RAID arrays on a daily basis? Yeah, pretty much. How many people have had to recover a failed RAID array? That's great for redundancy, right? Like, uh, if that was the point of a RAID array, you still have to do recovery. Uh, part of the problem is obviously this marketing problem. So I'm going to cover a couple of different uh, unusual types of RAID arrays. Then we're going to hit RAID 0, RAID 5, and then I'm going to try to do a demo. So hopefully it all fits in there. So, uh, so that's the idea of what we're going to cover. So I'm going to go ahead and answer the questions now. These are the three questions that I'm going to constantly get. So uh, yes, you can download these pictures, slides. MyHardDriveDie.com has got a... Uh, presentation page and DEFCON 17. I just posted these up there so you guys can go download them. And uh, her name is on the last slide. So if you can either download it or wait for the rest of this presentation, then you'll have her name. And yes, you can whatever, hire, however you give her money. And yes, she's single, but I know that, you know, for a lot of people here, because uh, I know a lot of you guys, it wouldn't make a difference whether she was married or single or anything. You don't, you don't care. I know. All right, so why are we going to talk about RAID recovery? Uh, the first reason here is uh, mainly because it's expensive. Anybody sent one into a recovery company before? Yeah, how much? 3000 That's probably just a, your personal array. See, that sucks, dude. Yeah? Yeah, you guys got... But it's, it's expensive, right? They usually either charge by the size, by the number of drives, and they usually even charge sometimes even if they don't get it back because it's so complicated to rebuild because you have multiple steps you got to go through. You've got to go through the physical side of repairing the disk that you need to repair. I'll cover that stuff in a second. Then you've got to go through the uh, reassembly mode, and then sometimes you've got to spit it out as a full array as one solid image so that you can parse through it in some package that doesn't crash when it runs into bad sectors or something. Uh, it's a lot more difficult than doing single drives. If you've seen my previous talks here, you know already that I've covered a lot with single drives, how to do physical repair. All that stuff still applies to these, whether it's SCSI drives, it's IDE drives, whatever RAID array you're dealing with, all of that stuff. So there's like 50 hours out there I've done on do-it-yourself, repair your own drive, how to go through that process. Um, time consuming, it fails. But the biggest thing here is that when I leave here, like I get hundreds of questions all the time about, I've, you know, it's not my one hard drive, I have this RAID array. So I'm trying to answer these questions in a talk so you guys can get this. So here's kind of my assumptions for the talk. The first one is, is that you've already done what you've got to do from my previous four or five years of doing this kind of talk about repairing that drive. So somehow you've repaired the drive and you've either got a DD image of it or you've got a physical clone of the drive running. And there's some weird things with some clones sometimes, so I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, and then we're also, when we're talking about RAID, my assumption here is that you're getting uh, a RAID array that you might not know anything about. Sometimes, because in the data recovery world, you may have the luxury of having a controller that you understand, that you know how the layout is of its own, your own personal array. But how many of you got the mystery box? You guys got that before, right? Like somebody hands you a pile and says, I don't know what this is, but somehow we got to do it. And if you're lucky, they route the number on the drives as they remove them from the RAID array. If not, then you've got like here's 52 cards and figure out which ones were in the right order. So that happens uh, a lot. And I'm counting on you having, you know, maybe not porn, maybe just pictures, but I mean, who doesn't have porn? I mean, you've been, even in company, you don't have porn, really? You're your boss or somebody might, but anyway, so <laughs> usually it's of themselves and that's, <laughs> all right. <laughs> 
All right, so it's kind of the do-it-yourself talk. I'm going to kind of just cover. I'm teaching you. The whole point is, is in one hour, as much as I can, uh, you're still going to have to kind of do some of your own research and figure some stuff out. Because if you can figure stuff out about the rate array itself, the order of the disk, the way they came out or whatever, great. If not, then we're going to kind of guess, and I'm going to show you how I guess as I go through this. After you've seen like 3,000 of these, it becomes kind of like Matrix stuff. You go girl in red dress or not in red dress or whatever, but you start to see it. Um, and... We're going to do it as cheap as possible. I'd like to say free all the time, but you know, let's face it, in the commercial industry, that's where you know, the reassembly of RAID is usually a commercial product, so you're going to sometimes be stuck with buying something, so I'm going to try to stick under 100 bucks, so at least it's affordable. And then, uh, and then basically, you know, the whole point is we're going to look at pictures and sound, and we're going to try to figure it out from those things. Uh, it's going to take you a lot of time. It's going to take you a lot of disk space. There's no easy way around those things. You've got to find pictures, and you're going to constantly have to be persistent and experiment. If you've got the drives and you've repaired it and you've got images of it, you can probably figure this out, but it may take you 24 hours to actually go through rotations and things that you can actually figure out. So research helps. Slides are on myharddrivedive.com. All right, so what is a RAID array? So Functionally, we have an array of independent, and this is where the, you know, the terminology kind of gets messed up. I think originally what happened was it was supposed to be a redundant array of inexpensive disks, and somebody took a bill to the boss, and he goes, how is this inexpensive? <laughs> Explain that to me. So, so it's gone to independent, and people make up a lot of other words to put in the I spot. So uh, uh, anyway, so this is all about marketing and redundancy. Some arrays are not redundant. So now what you have in the last eight or ten years that you didn't have before with RAID arrays is you've got a box that's on a shelf, and some photographer or something comes in, sees a box, and it says RAID on it, and he buys it. And then what is that usually? What RAID is that usually? Right, zero, right? And completely worthless for those people who thought it was redundant, right? So, uh, so that's our biggest problem is that you're going to see a bunch of RAID zero. You will still see RAID one. Even though it's supposed to be a mirror, you're going to see it from time to time because whatever crap got written to the first disk got written to the second disk bad too. Uh, and then you get RAID five. Those are going to be the most common. When you get into like RAID six, RAID five EE and E and you know, other variations of RAID, you're probably not seeing those or there's a backup, but for the most part, you're going to be dealing with RAID zero and RAID five, uh, at least in a data recovery arena or something. Um, so I get these mystery boxes, and we got to guess about it. So I'm going to talk about, just real quick, the unusual stuff, because usually you still have this multiple-step process. It's kind of like you have an operating system, but you also have a file system. So you have to deal with these things differently. So for instance, you may still have uh, the functional side of RAID, which is I've got slices, and they're on the drives, and they're all broken up in different orders. But then you may have some variations of what's actually happening to the data that's sitting on them, like XFS or ZFS or whatever else that they've written. So you have some combinations. One of the things that really kind of isn't really a RAID, but keep, people keep throwing it into that thing, is the JBODs. So you have JBODs, which are typically on like the LACI drives, or there's a bunch of different like phantoms and just different variations of drives. So I'll hit that real quick. XFS and ZFS. Uh, you're usually looking at like the Buffalo Terra stations, some variations of different ones that have Linux with Lacy drives. Lacy's kind of uh, promiscuous. They like one day of the week, or Lacy, uh, whatever they call it. But uh, one day of the week, there'll be one format. Another day of the week, there'll be a different one. So there's some variations you can start to look at and try to figure out what they are. But uh, those are some of the hardest ones to deal with because XFS and ZFS right now, very limited in the, in the number of tools that you actually have and how you process them, because there's no real easy way to deal with XFS other than doing like file carving or something like that. But that doesn't give you back metadata, like structure and directories and dates and times and file names. File names is the worst one to lose. Uh, so these are the kind of boxes that you're looking at when you're dealing with those kind of arrays. So let's talk about JBOD real quick. And who noticed that there's actually a drive on the <laughs> slide? That's what I thought, yeah. All right, so, uh, so drink. Is it every time there's porn, I got to drink? All right. So JBOD, basically just a bunch of disks. So you basically have a bunch of disks, however that they've stuck them together. Usually you're still talking about a pair. So you've got something that will basically have usually not a fan or anything. That's usually why it's broken, it overheated, something melted down. Um, now you'll have two disks, and typically what will end up happening is you'll have a file system on one disk, and the second disk will just be concatenated. There will be a board or something that helps concatenate it when you get to end of this disk, then go to the next disk. So they look a lot like this right here. So uh, physically, you take these drives out. 
one of the drives, this is going to be similar to kind of RAID 0 in the fact that if you don't have one of the drives, it's, it's da damaged. You've, got, you've lost data. There's nothing you can do about it. So you will have two drives. If they're a JBOD, one drive will still continue to have files on it that you can just do like standard file carving stuff, like go find all the JPEGs and copy them off. And you'll get those. You'll lose names and you'll lose structure and stuff. And the other disk is going to have the file system and sometimes have what's called an HPA on there. So you'll have a host-protected area, and it will be the size of the two drives together. So in other words, you'll plug in. Let's say these are two 250s, and together they make 500. The first drive will have an HPA on it that will say, I am 500 gigs. So you plug in this 250-gig drive, and it says I'm 500. Well, you know right away that that's what you're dealing with, that you've got one. And you know which one you have, too, because that will be the first one. That means the second disk is dead. So you have file system, and you can probably actually at least fix the files that exist on this one disk. So that's the one thing. So HPA. So this is common practice that you actually have to use an HPA. So a host protected area is basically that extra space that was on a disk that says, hey, I've got some utilities or I've got some DVDs or I've got this other stuff that's sitting out there. Its primary purpose was to make the disk smaller than it originally is. So there's this extra space. And it will report to the to the system as it's booting. And it will actually show up. So I could take a 500 gig hard drive and I could say, you're 40 gigs. And when I boot it, it'll actually say 40 gigs. Everything will think it's 40 gigs. It'll actually respect that content. So you're going to use that for some various things. Uh, most of the time, when you're cloning a disk that's damaged, you can't find the exact same disk. So you don't have the exact same geometry. So this is a way that you can set it. You can use the host protected area to physically set the size of the disk so that it matches. And you can use it in combinations with other things. So for instance, this is a NAS box. This is a little C NAS box. And there's no USB port or whatever. Now, what you can see here is I had two drives. These are the, there was originally a one terabyte a, a, a array, whatever you want to call it here with this particular one. So what ended up happening is I had the 500 gig that was good and I had a 500 gig that was bad. I took a one terabyte and I actually cloned the one terabyte. But now when I put it back in, I need the system with this custom board with whatever they did because my whole point is to make my life as easy as possible. I could probably do this in software, but why not let the hardware, if it's still functioning, do the job? So I cloned this drive in reverse using some special tools like DD Rescue to actually clone a drive in reverse. Then you set the HPA to the same size as the original drive, which you can look on the label and actually just in the software, there's a tool... There are several tools that will set HPAs. So one of them is called MHDD. So MHDD is a free boot disk. You can boot on, plug the drive into the ATA controller, and you can basically type in from the label what your size is, and it will make it that size. So I put the one terabyte drive in here, and now it's a 500 gig. And the two drives got bound back together again in the RAID array, and I was able to actually copy the stuff off physically without having to do any other work. So make sure that you're paying attention to things like that. If you're dealing with ZFS and XFS, which will all come after the fact, like if you've repaired a RAID 0 or RAID 5, you may still have XFS or something to deal with. There's really only two ways that I know of right now that you can actually deal with. There's one that's called Test Disk, which is basically for repairing partitions, and they've added XFS support to it. Uh, they currently, I do not think, have ZFS, but he adds things all the time. So uh, Test Disk is your one way to actually say, read all the files, repair partition structure, write it back. So keep Test Disk in mind. The other one is a commercial product, which is slightly more than $100. Uh, it's called UFS Explorer, and it does XFS, and there's a current version that actually supports ZFS. So it's one of the only ones I know of doing ZFS. So as you start running into new RAID arrays that have ZFS, you may need something like this. Uh, and you can see right here, this was a Buffalo Terra station that we actually mounted, and we were able to display and actually extract all the data after we corrected the physical problem with the disk. So that's enough of those other types. So let's talk about RAID 0. I know, Drake. All right, so RAID 0, just real quick. Basically, what you're looking at with RAID 0 is you have two or more drives, and they're bakes broken up into slice sizes. Now, there's some defaults that the controller will normally do, but, you know, you tech guys, every time I go to deal with one, somebody goes, hey, wouldn't it be nice if it was 8K this week? And they go into the controller and play with the sizes, so it's almost never the standard size or whatever you were thinking it was. But most of the motherboards and stuff that are locked down, you're going to end up with standard sizes where you'll have a slice size, and it rotates between the two slice sizes with your data. If one drive is dead and you cannot repair it, you cannot physically go through the process of my previous stuff, you will not get anything worthwhile out of it. You're going to get basically like a bunch of thumbnails. You're not going to get anything that's going to be really valuable except depending on the slice size. So if you have 32K slice sizes, 
Well, 32K is gone from every file, every other 32K. So you end up with nothing. So RAID 0 does not have any redundancy at all. So I try not to call it RAID 0. I try to call it AIDS. <laughs> so it is a RAID. It's going to suck. And suck it does, man. I'm just telling you, it's, it's terrible. So, and you try to explain this to people. They're like, oh, well, I had two drives, and it was RAID. Why can't I get those back? Well, uh, you know, it's a mess. Now, here's the bad thing. You can have a RAID 0 array with more than two drives. Most people think that there's only two drives in a RAID 0, but that's not true. You could go up to, like, I've had arrays in that had 14 drives in them. Now, now you're talking just crazy talk, because, I mean, it's like, it's... Now you, you don't have an order to the drives. You don't know the order of the drives. There's no signature written in most cases. You have to go through a process of guessing or looking for data that you might be able to guess in order. And, uh, yeah, that is those, for some reason, photographers, they don't get this. They're like, oh, look, I've got a Mac, and I can do software RAID, so I've got six drives hanging off a USB over here. On If you're not backing up, it's over. It's game over. So... So you can usually figure out which drive is the first drive. So if you have two drives, yes, you can figure out pretty quickly. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how many drives you have. In most cases, you can figure out what the first drive is. It's the rest of the drives that you have a problem with. Because most of the time, you're going to end up, because the majority of the drives, you're still looking at like NTFS or something. Uh, if you've got Linux or something, you've got other things to deal with. But you usually have an MBR. So at the MBR, at the beginning of the disk, is kind of kind of give you an idea. Hey, I'm number one. Or, you know, if you're dealing with NT or something, you'll actually have like an NT. TFS signature at sector 63. So you can actually figure out almost right away, and most software, once you've actually figured out how to repair the physical side of the disk and get it running again, even if there's some damaged sectors, they will actually tell you that this is the first disk, and they'll show you a disk signature. So we can figure that out as well. So uh, so this is just kind of my, my quick steps. I have more stuff on the slides that are online, so you'll get more detail if you go and download those. But ultimately what we're going to do is we're going to mount the images, we're going to review them, we're going to look at the sizes and basically play with each one, starting with a default. We're going to scan for some pictures. Then we're going to extract them, listen, you know, look at them, some MP3s. We're going to listen to them. Your goal is basically to look at something like this. If you know nothing else about the drive, you're going to start with slice sizes. So you have a variation of slice sizes that can go from 2K all the way up to 2 megs. Most of the time, I'm dealing with things that are between 5, 12, and 32K in the majority of them. The standard for most of them is around 64K. But you can have drives that I've seen several of them, especially uh, uh, the manufacturer chose some special stripe size if you bought it from somebody else and ends up being something like 512K. So you can go through the variations of looking at pictures and samples in between each of the sizes. So your goal is, while I'm processing the data, find a picture that looks like it's between 32K and 64K. Look at it and see if it looks complete, and then move on through each of the steps until you actually have rotated through them. So as you're rotating through them, you can see some things, and it starts to make sense when you've seen enough of them. So I've seen a 1,000 raids at this point, so it's like every time I look at one, I can just guess most of the time. But uh, So here's some of the samples. So <laughs> now, as convenient as it is that her head, I mean, uh, well, anyway... It's not going to be very convenient for the photographer or somebody that needs to get it back. So in this particular case, you're actually missing a stripe. So you either have a disk that's actually gone, or you're missing a big chunk of the data itself. And then you got stuff like this that's a uh, very small file. So typically, these are going to be, you know, your, your <laughs> you know, this is not, you know, I don't know why they had stick porn on their stuff, but either way. It's less than 32K, and you extract it, and it looks intact. It looks okay. There's nothing, nothing special about that. But... Here's a file that most of you should recognize, or two files that most of you should recognize. So right off the bat, you know that this is there's windows on the box, and these are the sample files. They're next to each other, and there are slice sizes that are wrong. But if you look at it, this particular one came off the drive and said it was 140K. So as you divide this up, you can start to see, hey, look, I'm looking at maybe a 64K stripe size. So you can almost tell right away if you actually have two. Now, if you had crap and it wasn't a JPEG or wasn't a BMP or something that was next to that, you would actually just get down to here, it would stop, and you just get crap from here on. So wherever it is, you're going to get crap. So we can actually use the crap to analyze things. So at the start of most of the pictures, you'll usually have a thumbnail that's stored in the picture. So you'll look at something, and you'll look, because they'll still look to your software as extracting the data. It'll still look like a JPEG. It'll just be a small one. So in this particular case, this was a thumbnail. It was a small thumbnail. It's 64K. So that thumbnail came out, but the original picture that was larger than that 
actually looks like this. So again, you start looking at it going, hey, I could start to tell what the stripe sizes are. Or you start looking at things like this. This is a thumbnail that came off the drive. Again, it was, uh, this one's like around 80K or so. And you can start to see it's intact down to, you, to the spot that actually starts to look like it's around 64K stripe sizes. You start getting big pictures, they start to look like this. You start getting like a little chopped up thing. So this is the kind of thing where like, uh, anybody seen Greg Conte talk before? So Greg Conte does all these like, I'm doing analysis of data and I do it visually and he like takes packets and throws them up and you can tell what's going on. Well, that's the same kind of thing you start to see here. You start getting, well, I know that now I've got these blocks of stripe sizes that are the same and then I've got this rotation that's actually moving and you can start to see as you're looking at pictures and images like, okay, so right here, this is part of her face. Is it actually in the picture or does it belong? It actually is part of the picture, and it's rotated through the slice. So in this case, we're looking at things that might have an arrangement order, a problem with the arrangement because the content actually belongs. Then you get to, like, really large files, like 10 meg files. And so you start seeing these chopped up things as they come from different segments of different pictures. So it starts to make sense. So once you finally get that, you'll actually get something that looks like this. So... So your goal is obviously to get to a spot where you can actually see the picture. So I'm going to start here on RAID 0. RAID 0 and RAID 5 are fundamentally the same from a standpoint of figuring this part out other than the actual arrangement itself. So I'm going to start with an MP3 sample, and then I'm going to do the demo actually on RAID 5 after we cover RAID 5. So here's my, here's my MP3. So if you have files, and most of us have like iTunes directories and stuff that are on our box, if the files are next to each other, when you extract them, they do a similar thing that the JPEGs do. They'll play a chunk, and then they'll play another chunk. And the chunks won't be together, and they won't make sense, but it'll come off as one file. So if you happen to have 70s porn on your hard drive or something like that, and you were to play it, this is the kind of stuff you'll get. And it, it'll sound like a long sample, but trust me, it's only like 40 seconds. Uh, it'll be enough. is a happy ass. But if it's a tight and unrelaxed ass, it's an unhappy ass. All right. So that's pretty much the way that goes. You'll get a lot of that. Anybody know who that last one was? Come on. You guys know Ron Jeremy. Don't act like you don't look at porn. Whatever. You're all in this talk. We know what's going on. I'm trying not to admit that. <clears throat> I told her she was going to be really popular. <laughs> and we'll put her phone number up. No. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about RAID 5 for a minute. This one's going to be a little drier, but let's get this out because uh, that's the important part. So, uh, so basically the first thing is controllers. It's really helpful if you know what your controller is, but fundamentally there's two different types of controllers that you have to pay attention to. And one is whether or not you actually have a host controller or a discrete controller. If you have a discrete controller, it basically means I have a processor on my RAID controller because there's going to be all this math that the functions actually have to be done to actually make this array work. If you have a host-based controller, you know, people think, oh, a host is great. I can take like eight of my IDE hard drives and I can add them all up. The more drives you add to a host-based controller, the more CPU power it's using from your CPU to actually do these calculations. Whereas the host, the, the uh, discrete controller actually is able to do the calculations for you to produce that content so that it's not actually impacting your, your system. And we're going to try to do all this in software. So the whole point is the more drives you have in your RAID array, the slower and the longer it's going to take to do these mathematical calculations in RAID to produce it. So we're going to talk about those in a minute. <clears throat> So the whole point of RAID 5, obviously, is that you want to keep your server up. You want to have some time where my data is redundant and that my system can continue to run. I have a drive that's died and that I'm going to replace it um, if one of the drives dies, but my system continues to run. But now the reason that you're seeing the RAID array in for some kind of recovery is usually one of these. The guy had one drive go bad and the alarm goes off. 
And the boss is walking by the door and he goes, what the hell is that damn alarm? Turn that crap off. That is so annoying. And they turn it off. They, and then what happens? Everybody knows what happens after that, right? Six months later, drive number two dies. Then you have a problem. And that's why it's in for recovery. Now, here's your big problem when you're dealing with this. If you have two drives that have died in a rate array, so rate arrays, typically, you have to have a minimum of three drives. So usually one drive can die, and you'll be fine. So however many drives you have in your rate array, one drive can die, you'll be fine. You can do this reassembly and do whatever. Two drives die. Which drive do you have to have? The one that recently died. The, first, the, la the last one is the one that has to be there because that's the one that has all the data that's synced to it. The oldest one that died is completely worthless. So if you don't know which drive died, because where are the log files for where the drive died? On the damn drive. Right. This is a great reason to actually copy all these log files maybe periodically, put them in a backup tape somewhere or something. Anyway, but uh, you need to know which drive died last or you're kind of screwed because you're going to rebuild two drives. You're going to spend twice as long actually getting this dot job done. So the less you know the worse off you are. So basically, it looks a little bit like this. You've got a stack of drives, and data parity is basically rotating through the drive. So there is no parity drive. I hear that all the time, like RAID 5 got a parity drive. No, it's distributed across all the drives. So you could put an X on any one of these drives, and it would be completely dead, and it would be fine. You have all the data that you need to do the calculation. So when you have a system, and it's all plugged in, and basically let's take a simple one, like these three drives here, you'll actually have the parity distributed. So now, this talk doesn't lend itself very well to animation, but I have some. Woo! All right, I just have this one nice fancy one. All right, again, now this is the, see if I can make it fit. All right, there we go. When you're talking about porn, you've got to always make it fit. All right, so uh, <coughs> this is the executive summary version, okay? So, again, take this with a grain of salt. And this is the one you want to show your boss when you're trying to say, I'd like you to buy a fancy Raid Array. And in the old days, we used to have to actually convince people. People remember, like, 2000, 2001, you had to say, we need a Raid Array on our server. And the boss was like, why do we need one? Well, this is the sample that you want to give him because it makes it very easy for an executive to understand why you have to have one. Okay. Okay, so the deal is, is that this is not the exact formula. You guys should all know that by now. It's not the exact formula that it follows. But your boss can understand this. He can get that down. Uh, maybe even photographers. But <coughs> ultimately what you're looking at is that at any point in time, if you took this formula and you have one X, people can figure out what's supposed to be in that one X from the data that exists. So what you actually are doing is an exclusive or arrangement on these so that you can actually produce that parity. But it's a much more complicated process and requires a very high-speed processor to do it. So this is why having a discrete controller is going to be a much better deal than a host-based controller. Host-based controllers, because they're cheap, they'll do just about anything. They're, they're a, a mess to deal with. But if you're dealing with a discrete controller, you spent more than $300 on the controller, which means there's documentation somewhere, and it didn't come just maybe from China. I don't know. But you know, at least you've got something that you can read, hopefully, and find out what your arrangement is or if they did anything strange like an offset or something. So, so that's my executive summary version. Okay, so this is the simple formula if you're dealing with this. You actually have an exclusive OR that's actually going to be between the drives to produce the parity. So the exclusive OR is the function that we're trying to deal with from, the, from that standpoint. <coughs> I just said this about the other. So this is the hard part with dealing with RAID 5. You've got so many Xs. Besides just the fact that you have an X which drive died, you actually have these other Xs which will become unknown. And hopefully you can eliminate two of these so you can try to guess what the other ones are. Because you'll end up with a disk order that's unknown. That's the easiest one to solve in most cases because all you have to do is make sure that the guy who knows that the array is dead wrote a number on the box before each drive is removed. 
That's the easiest one to deal with. So if you can convince people to do that before they ship them to you, you might be able to figure something out without having to spend a lot of extra time. Then you've got your variations and your slice sizes. Now, sometimes that configuration is stored on the disk themselves, and maybe you can't read that, or you can't get into the card, or you can't see the card, so you don't know what that is, so you're going to have to guess. And then you've got the arrangement. The arrangement is usually not something you can specify or select. It's usually something that the manufacturer chose. There's basically five or six different types of arrangements. And so those arrangements... It's important if you know which discrete controller it is, you can look them up. Um, and then you have fragmentation. Fragmentation is going to impact you in this demo that I'm going to do all together. But fragmentation, as most of you know, you, you've just got to deal with fragmentation. So what you're going to do is you're going to check multiple pictures. You're going to have some that are corrupt no matter what because of the way that the layout is. So when you click on them, you're not going to get anything. But as you click through a dozen or tw you know 20 of them, you'll figure out which ones you can view and which ones make sense and just ignore the others that are bad that you can't do. So they start to look like jigsaw puzzles. So we have something kind of similar to this from that standpoint. We actually have the same thing with RAID 0, same basic slice sizes that you've got to deal with. But there's some extra things that you can do to try to figure out the steps. So here's kind of my extra slide. This is the bonus stuff. You don't have to do this to do it. Once you've actually done enough views of the drives, you can figure this out by sight. But here's one thing you can do. Anybody ever done a manual carve of JPEG files? How many people done that? Yeah. Okay, so for the people that haven't, it, it sounds like some big mystery all these forensics guys are doing. Oh, manual carving, whatever. Uh, all it means is I copied the hex crap out of the drive. That's all it means. So what ends up happening, let's just say I go and I look up the JPEG standard. In the JPEG standard, you got FFDA, FF is basically what your file is going to start with. So you're going to end up with a JPEG header. It's always going to begin with FFDA to FF, and it's going to end with FFD9. So you'll be able to go from beginning to end and cut something out. So if you go into a hex editor and you just look at the content, you do a search for FFD8FF. So when you actually get to that spot, the first thing you want to do to find out is whether or not you've got a false positive. Is this a false positive? No. Because the easiest thing you can tell right off the bat is you've got some EXIF information. So there's data that's actually stored in the picture about the picture. So you'll get things like the camera, dates and times, and stuff like that. That stuff is very valuable to help you figure out in the RAID array how to reassemble it. Because this is probably, the beginning of the picture is probably going to be a JPEG. So if I extract this data, even if I can't view the actual file, the JPEG is typically going to be smaller than my slice size. So I can see the, the thumbnail itself. So if I extract it and I just save it to a directory, the picture itself won't open. The picture is complete and utter crap. You can't see anything. But I'm just going to use Explorer by highlighting over the picture, and it'll tell me what size that the dimensions are supposed to be. But you can see it says it's 8K. I mean, that's a pretty small thing, so that's not the real picture. But you take these numbers, and you can go to a website, and it'll calculate for you what the actual size is supposed to be. You plug them in. And you come down here to what your JPEG process is going to be, and you can figure out, I mean, most photographers are going to save it somewhere in the 100% range most of the time. So you're going to end up with like a 2 meg file. So then you can actually take the files as you extract them, and you go through the process, and you can kind of break it down. You could say, look, it's a, supposed to be a 2 meg file. So what is my slice size? And so you just start dividing until you actually look like you're starting to get a slice size that's contiguous. And what that slice size is contiguous is most of the time the actual correct slice size, even though in this particular case we may have a rotation in order or we may have slices that are out of order, so I have drives out of order. But I can still tell that this is probably going to be a 64K slice size. So you have other things to look at, which are do these other slices belong to the same picture? So this is where you're going to resolve two X's at one time. If the picture has slices that, are, that look weird and don't fit in the picture, then you've got an order problem also. So not only do you have the slice size problem, you've got an order problem, and either the arrangement of the, of the logical component of the drive is going to be wrong, or the order of the physical drive that you have is wrong. So I'll kind of give you a picture of that. So if you look at this, there's, a, there's basically four major ways that the data is arranged on RAID arrays. And uh, this is typically Linux terminology. Windows has the same kind of thing, but they call it stupid stuff like forward and backwards and dynamic, and they just make other crap up. But it's pretty much the same thing. So you're looking at these orders. So um, I'm going to focus on the first two because the first two are the most common. So you end up with what's called the left asynchronous. So you basically can tell where your slices are. So you'll have like a strip that's good, a strip that's bad, and so on and so on as it rotates through. And you'll have a second set that will actually be different orders in the numbers. And so you'll actually have content. The picture will actually look fairly similar to this. You'll actually get a picture that if once you've got the order of the drives correct, that the content that's in the picture 
rotates through in the same order and looks fairly similar. So as you look through these slices, then you start to go, hey, which order is this one? I can pick them. So this is the tool that I'm just going to use basically to show this. So I can actually load my three drives up. This is going to be the order of it. And so this is one of the arrangements. This is one of the other arrangements that I can deal with. So you can start to see and do a comparison. And then once you actually put them back together, you'll actually get the complete picture itself. So what are the steps that I would normally do to do this? Um, I'm going to repair the bad drives. I'm not going to waste a lot of time. That's like the first thing that I see so many people do. Like, oh, we got seven drives in for, for recovery. They image the first six. Like, well, what about the bad drive? Because if you don't get the bad drive back, or the first five, if you don't get the bad drive back, you're not going to get the one that you actually need. It won't matter how much work you do before that. It's going to be all wasted time. So I work on the bad drive first, and sometimes you just have to start doing an image or something to test to figure out which one's the bad one. But most of the time you know pretty quickly. Then you can actually deal with imaging the good ones and stepping through the process, test the data, and then once you finally actually have them assembled, you can go back. Now, on the thing that I was talking about, let's try to do something free. There is a Perl script out there that somebody wrote to try to help out with this, and it's been used several times, so it's functional and works. So if you just do a search for Mike Hardy, you'll actually find that there's a Perl script that's already written to kind of step through them, and you modify it according to your array. So you would still have to kind of know something about it. All right? So let's go through the process of what we're going to deal with with our, our goals. So our goal was let's use something that's less than $100 and try to rebuild. Now, there's some tools that will rebuild RAID 0 but won't rebuild RAID 5. So make sure that if you buy something that you know what you're doing, which one you're going to buy. So I have two primary choices that I would use. RAID Reconstructor from Runtime.org is 99 bucks, and then there's RStudios uh, from RTools. And that, that's actually a great buy because RStudio is 79 bucks or something for their standard edition, and it does, like, all the file systems except for XFS and ZFS, but it does the rest of them. So you can typically do everything all at once, including macOS or whatever. Um, RAID Reconstructor, I'm not going to show at the moment because RAID Reconstructor, it guesses, and if it's right, it'll tell you. If it's wrong... What it will normally do is tell you what its entropy is. And the trick with RAID Reconstructor is if there's an OS equals 4, if you see OS equals 4, those are the ones to try. So there'll be a column that'll say OS equals 4, and you'll have four or five drives in the list out of 70-something drives. It'll tell you which ones are the ones with the highest entropy. Those are the ones to test. But I'm going to show our studio. So that's what my demo is going to be on. Next question? All right, so hopefully this will be the right size for me to see. <clears throat> okay, so I don't so much care about the actual product itself. My whole goal is to be able to see what's manually going on, to actually know what's going on. Uh, so hopefully this is a big enough window for me to see all the buttons. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Drives, and I'm going to open Image Files. So I've made DD Image Files. I've made a pair of them. So this is a RAID array that had three. Now, if this is unknown, basically you take your defaults and then you kind of work your way back from there. So ultimately what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to take these uh, DD image files of two of the drives that I've repaired, and I'm going to try to see what the content is from there. So since I have two out of a RAID array that's supposed to have three drives, I have to make a fake one so that the parity is calculated. So I'm going to highlight these and add it. Now the first thing, which drive is number one? So you see right away that the software actually identifies in these two image files that I actually have a sector that actually identifies itself as NTFS. So I actually have, now this was a hardware array, and I broke it basically to do this demo and made these dem image, image files of that particular one. But I have two, two image files here. I'm missing the missing drive, but I know which one's number one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and create me. They, they call it virtual block RAID. So this is going to be my RAID 5. So I make kind of a fake set here. Then I'm going to add each one of my drives to this. So I right-click, and you'll actually see your drives and your partitions. The drives are the one that's mattered because the partition is going to be at an offset, and you don't want to use the offset. So I'm going to add the two drives I have. Now, right now, I cannot see my boxes. So I'm going to add my missing disk. Now, if you have to change the order, then you can actually drag the missing disk around and figure out what order it's supposed to be in to actually put it where it belongs. And now I'm off the screen, way off the screen. They told me they were 1024. 
Okay, so I'm doing a RAID 5 array, and so now, sorry about this kind of thing. I actually tested this in the back with the same projector. They said this is what it's going to do. Can't see all my boxes. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and check this box that says apply changes immediately. Every time I actually change it, it's going to actually dynamically uh, change them physically in the drives. So this is what my order looks like. And so I have a RAID 5. I'm going to leave it at its default, which is almost always 64K. And then you'll actually see that you have all those alternatives that I actually talked about right here. But we're going to test this array, and we're going to find out what it is that we actually have. So after I've added them to the array, I'm going to come back over here to my other box. It'd be helpful if they use the same exact projector. So now you'll see I actually have my virtual array, and then I've got my partition, my first partition. What I want to do is I want to scan for JPEGs. So I don't care about any of this other stuff. So I'm going to right click, and I'm going to say scan for JPEGs. So I get a box that actually asks me. I know which OS it is because it already gave me identifying information. So I'm going to throw away all the other OSs to make it faster. I'm just going to do NTFS. There's all these other things that most of the tools, if you actually use a scanning tool that goes and scans for stuff, you need to deselect all this other crap. We don't need anything else except JPEGs. So I would actually just go down to graphics, and I would actually just go down and select JPEGs, add them to the table. That's all I care about to find out. And we're only testing this. We're not trying to waste 75 hours scanning the drive to figure out what I got. That's what most of the tools do. So we want to do it faster than that. I'm going to leave detailed view on because there's a unique thing that our studios can do that most of the others can't do while they're scanning, and that's let you look at data. So right now, as it's going across and it's scanning, if you hover over the ones that are color, they'll tell you three of the files that I've picked are, are coming up in this block. And as you keep going, they'll tell you specific documents. You can click on them, and it'll give you a little box that says, well, what kind of files did I find? And even better than that, I can click on the file, and I, what I want to know, is this a false positive? That's what I care about in this whole thing, except that now it's off the screen and I can't see it. So, anybody think that this is a false positive? Right, so I've got data here that actually matters to me. Well, I did that and it doesn't... Thanks, buddy. Appreciate that. <laughs> no! <laughs> so we added 55 minutes to the presentation in our process here. So it's all to do with resolution of the... They have this projector in the back, and I tried all this, and they said, this is the one you're going to be using. Oh, really? <sighs> That's the last time I listened to somebody in the... You know, enough crap goes wrong with demos, we don't need to be adding to it. <laughs> God dang it. Yeah. You know what it is? It's all these damn porn pictures I got on the thing. God dang it. Yeah, demo fail. It wouldn't have been. It had been fine. All right, hang on. <sighs> All right, maybe. All right. Cool. All right, so uh, this is not a... Now I still have the same problem I had before. Now it may be worse because I can't get to the corner, at least before I had that. <sighs> Yay. Okay. X. So it is not a... Now, we're going we're gonna to stop it. We don't need it to continue on scanning, so we're going to go ahead and stop it because I don't care about any of this other stuff. All I want to know is I actually got a JPEG and that I actually have something that's not a false positive. So I'm going to go look at the file I actually have. 
So I can actually go down in here and I can say, well, I'm going to click on one. Now this one says it's about 50K. So now if you look at it, you'll actually see, hey, this must have been a really, really large picture. And so that 50K is like way wrong, but I've got a stripe there. And I can do the same thing I said before where I can actually go and say, oh, I'm going to go recover my actual picture and try to figure out what size it's supposed to be. So you can go and actually just save it out and save out your thumbnail or whatever else you're going to look at. Go look at your thumbnails. So now this is the picture. This is actually what I'm going to save. So I can actually do, and but you know from the size that we're looking at approximately a 2 meg picture. And so if I click on it, then this is what I'm going to get. So if that's 2 megs, if that's 2 megs and you're actually looking at this, you're probably looking at, again, uh, is not going to be a 64K slice size. That's probably what the 64K is because that's what we asked for. So we've got two stripes together. So half of that is 32K, right. So that'll tell you right off the bat that you can actually tell just from, from that content. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this. I'm going to delete this, uh, the scan that I just did because I don't care about it anymore. I'm going to go back to my raid array, and now I'm going to make my changes to, hey, I'm getting good at this. So I'm going to make my changes. I'm going to go ahead and set it at 32K, which is what it looked like visually to me that it might be. So then I come back and I do the same kind of thing. I can go to the partition. I can scan. And if I leave it the same, it's going to be all the same details I already did. Give me a couple of JPEGs, blah, blah, blah. See if I have one that's not a false positive. Not a false positive. Same kind of thing I did before. Close that. Then we're going to stop again. Go ahead and look at the same things. We're going to look at our file itself. Go into the files. Okay. So now if you look at the picture, it's a little dark on the screen, but if you look, you start to have some contiguous stuff. Does this actually look like it probably belongs to the same picture? Yeah, like this piece, move over, that piece, move over. Okay, so we know we probably have that, but we have a wrong arrangement. They look like they belong to the same picture. So let's delete that. Let's go look at our arrangement. So we were using this arrangement, which is standard, so that's the first one. Most RAID arrays do not use, or at least most of the ones I'm dealing with, are not using write, and as and, uh, write asynchronous and synchronous. So our second choice is going to be continuous which is the rotation in the other side. So now you can actually go back and do the same exact thing again. Scan. Go ahead. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip trying to do the, do I have a false positive? And I'm going to go look at it. Look at my pictures. Look at the array. And it's the same thing. You just keep re rotating through them. The other thing that uh, you can do really quickly if you wanted to to try to figure things out, especially in this tool, is that there's an option for like taking a partition. Let's say I went back and I like munged it up again. Let's say I go back and I say, oh, look, uh, it's a 64K and I got something out of order again. You can, you can do a couple of quick things by sight if you just know directory structures anyway. So if you actually said, hey, I'm just going to delete on the, I'm going to look at the partition and see what files it says I have. Well, it's pretty not supposed to have. You've got things that are missing. You're missing your files, your windows, things like that. As you rotate through the others, you can actually start selecting just variations on directories. When you get the right one, it's going to be obvious. You're going to have a documents and settings that actually has folders in it that are going to work correctly. So you can step through all those. So, so demo fail work. How about that? All right, so... And that's it. There you go.